Wow, I enjoyed that. I heard, matter of fact, I got out of my office this morning. I was in my office, heard them practicing, and jumped up there with them and thought, wow, that's what it's all about. So glad you're here today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 will be where we'll be focusing our thought there today. And of course, it's, it, it's a verse that's often used and repeated, and I use it in soul winning and talking to folks about their soul. Many, many times in my lifetime have I used this text and reminded folks about what it says. If you would please stand. Brother Rodney's going to read, Rodney Palisano, and uh, he's going to read verses 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We then, as workers together with him, beseech ye also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the time accepted, is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for what you have given to us. We thank you for what you have prepared for this day. Thank you for the songs to our soul and the preparing of our soul for the receiving of this message. And Lord, we'll pray that you'll get all the glory and the invitation. I know you're dealing with every heart in this room. There's not a person that's entered into this room that, Lord, you're not tugging on their heart for one purpose or another. It could be there's someone in this room that's never been born again. And I know the Holy Spirit of God is active at all times, wooing and drawing the sinner to Jesus. And then for all of your children that are in this room, I know that you're also active and working every moment of our life after our salvation to mature us and grow us and give us, Lord, faith for the journey. We know this all is your will to be accomplished on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said. Thank you, you may be seated. Simply entitled, The Day of Salvation. The Day of Salvation. So, have you had that day? Has that day happened in your life? Good question, isn't it? It's the, it's the supreme question to answer in your heart. You must know whether you have had that day of salvation. You need to, you need to trace back and look back at a moment, a time, and a place. Well, you've heard my testimony at 11 years of age. I'll never forget the day of my salvation, the moment that I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I've never gotten over it. I've never, I, I, it's the supreme day of my life. It's the best day of my life. It's the greatest event that ever happened. And for every believer, you have that same that same exact understanding. Because that day defines where you'll spend eternity. When you come to this particular quotation in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it's the apostle Paul who uses Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 8, this is where this comes from the Old Testament. The reaching out to the world that God has given us a day of grace. Now folks, I'm, I'm telling you that I get to stand up here before my generation and preach that Jesus saves, that God has a plan for our salvation. That, that, that's the most awesome message that any human ear could ever hear. Anybody that can hear the message of Jesus Christ is very, very fortunate, very, very, very blessed that you get to hear a clear presentation that God loves you enough that he dispatched his son to this earth, 
that he sent him here for the express purpose of dying for the debt of your sins and he paid it in full and that he offers to you a grace gift today that is to be received by you. God doesn't force this gift on you. He offers it. And of your free moral agency, of your own volition, you can accept God's gift of salvation. And I've got good news for everybody in the room. We still are operating in, at this very present moment, the day of grace, the day of salvation. This is, this is another day on planet Earth. I, I know this on the calendar is is June 14th, 2015. I know that we assemble on a Sunday, the Lord's Day. This is a day that, the, that, that we come together in corporate worship. Uh, we, we get to fellowship on our way to heaven together. And, and I love coming to Bible Baptist Church. I love the fact that I get to pastor and be a part of the greatest church in the world. And I literally mean that with all my heart. They're in, a, they're, in a, they're in another place I'd rather be. They're in another people I'd rather fellowship with and rub shoulders with on my way to heaven. I, I've just chosen to throw it down here, and here we are, and uh, I, I probably enjoy it more than you do. I, I, get to, I get to be here and be a part of this great church family. And I love seeing what God does. Every single service, every time we assemble together, God does something very special and he puts his fingerprint on it and he puts his touch on it and he put and he tugs on our hearts through messages of we have had missionaries and we've had other pa pastors or preachers or people that have and and staff and laymen and people that have preached and taught and, and i'm just telling you i love i love all of that i love everything about what god gives us through the local fellowship this local assembly i i just enjoy it I don't know what God's going to do today. I don't know whose heart God's going to touch today. Aren't we excited that God is in the operation and in business today, that we woke up and that God still has his plan for salvation in operation? I'm just excited that we get to be a part of it. It really is something very, very important, very, very unique, very, very uh, satisfying is to see God at work. Amen? See God do something. And so we come with these thoughts and and. We, we just draw out from this verse and verse two that, that says, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time, except in my first point today, my first thought is that, that this is the hearing time. This is the time which God says, I'm gonna hear, I'm, I'm gonna hear you. This is the time God said, I'll hear you. Now, anytime you get a, an audience with a CEO of the universe and that he's willing to hear you, that you have a hearing by God, that you can appear before God this morning and he says, you've got my ear. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to respond. In, in, in just the mere fact that a sinner has the ear of God concerning salvation, the fact that anybody on this planet could have that audience, the fact that anybody could have God's ear inclined to them, the fact that God says, and Paul, he just simply says, he, he just simply says it like this, for he saith, this is this is now, he's, he's quoting God's words. I have heard thee in a time accepted. Here's, here we've got God who's saying, I'll listen to you. You know, the older I get, the harder hearing I am. I have to have folks repeat themselves a lot. I'll go, you know, what, what, what's one of my favorite phrases to Shirley? What'd you say? <laughs> huh? <laughs> what? What'd you say? Let me turn my good ear to you. Which one is it? I don't know. <laughs> They're both bad. But you know what? God doesn't have any hard hearing. He's, he's listening to every sinner, everywhere on this earth at the same time, and that everybody's included, and God's listening. I mean, that's just amazing. That's, that's so mind-boggling to me that God concerns himself with us enough. He says, I'll listen. I'll, I'll hear you. And I'll hear you. And, and not, only, not only do we find that, that God will hear us, but, uh, but, but, the fact that, but the fact is that uh, he says it's the accepted time. It's the accepted time. You know, this is a limited time offer. I, I want you to know. I, I, I want everybody to be aware of, and I'm just 
a, a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I, I, and, I, and I get to do this by permission, and, and we get to sit today in a comfortable environment, and, and uh, it, it, you know, I, we've done the best we can to provide this environment, and God has given it to us, and, and it's just comfortable, and we sit on padded pews in a, what I really consider is a very, very comfortable uh, uh, temperature. I, some, some are shivering right now. Some are, have always complained about it being too cold. You've you got to understand, there's one person that set the temperature in this room. One person. Dave Brinkman. <laughs> Dave, raise your hand. Blame Dave. Because it's computer, it, you know, these are just sensors. You can't walk up and turn them up or down. And I know every, somebody, if we, had, if, we had, if we had a little, you know, a way to turn the temperature up or down, I guarantee we'd have a line at that. But it's all done by computer. I, it, it's a decent, you know, give or take. You may, you, it may be that you want five degrees warmer. It may be that you want five degrees cooler. You see, we've got it. We, we're trying to satisfy everybody in the room. We're, we, hit the, we hit the middle. We went down the middle and said, here it is. Y'all believe that, don't you? <laughs> but see, it's not about... We're in this room, and it's just a temporary place. We're just passing through. And, and as best as, we, as, as you'll ever have it, you're, you're able to listen today to something very, very important. Gar regardless of what, it, what, what we experience externally, it's what happens internally that really matters. And I'm praying today and have been praying that the Holy Spirit of God would arrest somebody's soul today and cause them to consider, if not for the first time, at least bear upon their heart a very important piece of information and that God says, I will listen to you, I have heard thee. And then he says, this is the right, this is the accepted time. God has a, has, listen, there's, there's, a, there's a calendar of events and God controls this. Not me, not you, not anybody else. God controls a calendar of events. And these, these events, many... If you read your Bible, a lot of them have already taken place. We go to the Old Testament, you can rehearse wonderful stories that have already transpired. Men have lived, women have lived, and uh, had faith in Messiah to come. And then you come into the New Testament, and it's uh, a history book, and it's 2,000 years ago that, it, that this was written. But there are future events that have yet to happen. There are things that have not happened that are, that are predicted and prophesied from this book. You see, we are in what is considered the church age. Some would call it the age of grace. It's always been an age of grace. It's always been grace. From the garden till the last person is saved, it'll always be the day of grace. It's only by grace that people... Uh, God's grace. But this is considered the church age, the age in which the operation of the church for the last 2,000 years has been in operation, and it's, it's just simply a parenthetical time in which we are able to preach the everlasting gospel of, pre, of, of peace, the everlasting gospel of God, God's great gospel, that good news to mankind, and we are still in this business operating and it's a 24-7 effort, and it's all around the world, and people are preaching, and people are teaching God's Word, and people are getting saved. This coming July, 6th through the 16th, I have the privilege of going back to uh, our dear friend and member of this church, his family, Steve Vellante, in Ghana, Techeman area, in Ghana, West, West Africa, and I cannot wait to get there and see again, meet some of the same folks and some of the new believers that were there a year ago that we got to win to Christ and preach to them. And, but we're going, in, we're going into a brand new city that they've never been before 
and sending a team and I'm going in with them. We're preaching day and night and we're going to establish by the end of the week. In one week's time, we're praying and I want you as a church family praying for the effort. We're gonna establish a brand new baby church and establish a pastor uh, that is ready to go, has already had a burden for that area and they're gonna step in his family and they're gonna lead that congregation of new believers. We're praying now for new believers to be baptized and started have a nucleus for a brand new baby church. Would, isn't that exciting that we get to go and be a part of that? And, uh, and, and I, can't, I can't wait. But listen, it's only, it's only a period of time that we can operate in this church age. I don't know if the rapture, which is the next event on God's calendar of time, that may be the next event that takes place. It's an accepted time. It's a limited time. It, it's just a, a little bit of time left before this offer for the day of salvation runs out. It's going, to, it's going to come to a conclusion. I want you to be aware of that. And so anybody in the room that has yet to receive Christ, that yet has that day of salvation, cannot reference that moment, that time, and that place, then you're, you're the target of, of the Holy Spirit of God this morning, wooing and drawing you to Christ. The same Holy Spirit that wooed and draw, drew me to Christ and wooed and drew many believers in this room to Christ is the same Holy Spirit, has not changed with the same wooing, the same drawing. Everyone that's been saved remembers that experience of that wooing and drawing. That's what the Holy Spirit of God is doing right now. And if you sense the need, if you feel the need to be saved, that's the Holy Spirit of God wooing and drawing you. If you're so, and, and folks, I understand, there, there, is a, there is a condition of heart where folks uh, refuse the Holy Spirit of God. They refuse the invitation. They say no to the Holy Spirit of God. And they resist. That's dangerous for the soul of that individual. Because there's not a person in this room knows when their last breath will be on this earth. There's not a person knows that. So I tell you today that this is the except this is the best time. This I can't I can't stress that enough. There's not a there's not a greater moment in your life to be saved. Now This moment is fleeting. Did you, did you know yesterday's gone forever, tomorrow never comes? And we live, we live right now. And I, I, I know that God lives in the present tense also. When he told, when he told uh, Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, when Moses said, what am I going to tell him? He said, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am sent me unto you. God's a present tense God. I am. Not he was, not he will be. I am. I am right now. You know what God is to you right now? He is the God of salvation to you right now. I am. God is the great I am. Jesus in John 8, 58 said much the same thing. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. He He's God in flesh. Jesus was on this earth. He's the great I am. He's the one that came to die in our place. He's God in flesh. You and I are here today. Hebrews 9, 27, I didn't give it to you, but Hebrews 9, 27 says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. After this, the judgment. It's a fleeting moment to transact business with an eternal God. But today is the day of salvation. It's the time that God hears you. It's the time that's accepted. And then thirdly, I just called it, it's saving time. It's time for salvation. It's time to be saved. If I could impress upon anybody if I could urge anybody, 
if I could somehow uh, present an urgent plea, it would be this, that you need to be saved today. In 1871, D.L. Moody, a great preacher of old, began a series of messages at a place called Farwell Hall in Chicago, Illinois. Huge crowds came. Back then, I'm telling you, thousands would come and listen to Moody preach. And on the fifth Sunday night, on the fifth Sunday night, he preached to the largest congregation that he had ever addressed in that city. He preached on the text, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ. At the close of the service, he did not call for an immediate decision. He said, I wish you would take this text home with you and turn it over and over in your minds during the week. And next Sunday, I want you to come back and I will take you to Calvary and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. He dismissed the service without an invitation except to implore upon them to turn it over and over in their minds until the next time they were to come together. He considered that later to be one of the greatest mistakes of his life. For between those two Sundays, the great Chicago fire broke out. Even as Mr. Moody went home from that service that Sunday night, he saw the glare and the glow of the flames in the distance. It destroyed Farwell Hall and soon on the 22nd anniversary of that fire, Moody addressed a large Chicago audience and he said these words, I have never dared to give an audience a week to think of their salvation since. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I have never seen that congregation since. I have hard work to keep back the tears today. I have looked over this audience and not a single one is here that I preached to that night, which I have never forgotten. And that is when I preached, when I preach now to press Christ upon the people then and there and try to bring them to a decision on the spot, I would rather have that right hand cut off than to give an audience a week to decide what to do with Jesus. There's a reason why you're here today. I really don't want to give you a week to think about it. We're not going to stand up right now and have dismissal prayer and you walk out. Because I believe with all my heart that there are folks in this room that have contemplated, thought about, and now the Holy Spirit of God has so uniquely brought you to this moment, time, and place. And that you woke up just like everybody else when God gave the sun and allowed, allowed this earth to rotate and gave us another day in Chickasha, Oklahoma, we all woke up, but the day that we woke up to was this, was this day called salvation. The day of salvation. If you had one business to conduct today, you may have woke, woke up with plans to go fishing, enjoy the day with your wife or your family, go eat, have some time together, Go to your house, do some things. I don't know what you've planned to do. But if in the planning of your life today, you would pause and stop and think, am I ready for heaven? Is, if I died right now, would I be in heaven? Would I have 
an eternity with Jesus Christ and all the saints. And if you can't, if you do not have that settled in your heart, then I've got great news for you today. Today is the day of salvation. All that's required is for you to admit yourself a sinner before God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Sin is the problem. Our predicament is we can't get to God because of our sin. We fall short, that verse tells us. You go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, and it's an awesome verse that shares with us this great and wonderful message of God's love. The fact that he commends his love. That word commendeth means showed or demonstrated. God showed his love. Look what God did. He, he loved us enough that he showed us how much he loved us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Here's what, here's what the, the focus of salvation and who the focus of salvation is on is on Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us, took our place. He took our place. Of course, Romans 6, 23 Romans 6.23 tells us that God has a gift for us. The wages of sin is death. Yes, we find that that's, a, that's an important bit of information, isn't it? Everybody, everybody understands that sin has been piling up. It, you, there's a debt. There's a debt of sin that keeps piling up in your life. What, do you, what have you done with that debt? You can't do anything with it, can you? It just keeps piling up. But look what God has offered. And this is the day of salvation. And this is what God is offering to you today. A gift. A gift has the connotation that somebody else paid the price for that gift. And you don't earn or deserve it. And that's the truth of the matter, isn't it? And so with this gift that you didn't earn or deserve, but God is giving it. And that gift just happens to be what? Eternal life. And who is it brought to you by? Remember Jesus? It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I always come and bring folks to this verse. And I like to sometimes just say, you know, if, if I was a multi-billionaire and you knew it, and I wrote you a $1 million check, and I took that check and I You know I was good for it, and I put $1 million on it, and I put your name, and then I, I put my name down there because I'm the owner of the account. I have the account. And then I just simply say, here, I want you to have it. I want you to have it. I'm a, I'm a multi-billionaire. I've got enough money to give everybody in the room a million dollars. And so today I'm going to write down your name, and I'm going to offer you this check. And so I'm offering it. It's a gift. How does it become yours? You have to accept it. You have to take it. I can offer it all day long. You can even go tell people, Kim Hayes, has, he, he's offering me a million dollars. You can know about it, but it never becomes your, yours until you what? You have to receive it. And that's an on-purpose transaction that you have, to, you have to do the business with me about. I can offer it. And here's God's offer of eternal life. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord. How then did God define how a human being on this earth would receive this grace gift? And when you go to Romans chapter 10 and begin in verse 9 down through 13, we'll, we'll learn about this. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if it's conditional notice the word if if you do this this is what's going to happen God God will take care of, he's taking care of everything all you got to do is show up all you got to do is receive all you got to do is have the will to do this that's all that's all that's required that if and then it gets real personal thou how many vows are in the room Old English, you. How many, how, many, how, many, how many folks are here? So everybody qualifies for this wonderful salvation, right? If you can understand this, even a child can understand this and believe and receive Jesus Christ today. 
This could become the day of salvation for a child. This could become the day of salvation for a teenager. This could become the day of salvation for a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, 70-year-old, 80-year-old, 90-year-old. The oldest person I ever saw trust Christ was 94 years of age. Greater Memorial Hospital. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. See, it's all about Jesus, right? If you'll confess Jesus, you don't, you don't even get in the door without Jesus. You don't get past first base without Jesus. You don't, you don't have salvation without Jesus. It's only Jesus, by the way. No other way. Given among men whereby we must be saved. And believe. Now, here's, here comes in that act of your faith and that he gives you. You don't have that. He gives it to you. To believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. What's the guarantee and in writing that will happen? You'll be saved. Saved. Saved has that connotation that we're in trouble. And sure enough, we all are. Because see, without Jesus Christ, I want you to consider yourself just dangling over hell by a thread. That's all it is. just takes one moment and you'll be in the confines of hell for eternity. I, that's no option. I don't, want, I don't want anyone in this room to end up in hell. And so here's God's salvation. We'll go to another verse. For with the heart, that's how it happens, man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I've not, I've not met one believer that's ashamed of Jesus. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. And then verse 13, for whosoever. shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's stand to our feet with heads bowed. Every head bowed right now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I have done to hundreds and hundreds of folks in my ministry. I, I've, I've done it on the, at, at, in homes. I've, I've done it to folks incarcerated in jail. I've done it to waiters and waitresses standing by the by the table. I, I've done it here at church, here at the altar. And it doesn't matter the time or the place. It can happen now. Right now, I'd like to lead you if you've never, if you have never on purpose prayed to receive Jesus Christ while standing there right now. You feel the need to pray. You've never done this before. You've never exercised your will to trust Jesus and be saved then right now, right now, right now, I want to lead you in a prayer for salvation. And you can pray like this from your heart to the Lord. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've sinned against you. And I'm so very sorry. Please come into my heart and save me. Thank you for dying on the cross for every sin I'll ever commit. Thank you for loving me and giving me your salvation today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, with every head bowed, you just prayed that prayer. <laughs> you know you did. And you're not ashamed. I want, you to, I want you to just come down here and tell me, I just received Christ as my Savior and I'm so happy. And I'll pray with you and one of our workers will take your name. You can make yourself a candidate for baptism. Identifying with Jesus Christ through the act of baptism. Brother Sean, just as I am, on this very first verse, I want you to come meet me right down here. I just accepted Christ. I just got saved. I'm not ashamed. Come on. Just, just as come on. 
I just step out from where you're at. Come on. I'm not ashamed. I just took care of an eternal matter. I'm glad I accepted Christ. Don't worry about who's beside you. Come on. Just step out. I'm just glad I got saved. Anybody at all? Disappointed nobody stepped out yet. You see, this issue is not between me and <laughs> me and uh, me and anybody else in the room. This, this is between you and God. I just gave you an opportunity to make this public, but you know what? There may be Christians in this room. And you need to come today. You you've already been saved. Whatever the this invitation's open to every single person to come today. And I took care of my part. I, I, my hands are not bloody before the Lord. I will not stand one day in, in, in judgment against a people that I, I somehow slighted them or did not give them all the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I, my part in it today was to deliver the message. Now I know that it's between you and the Holy Spirit, not me and you. Brother Sean, why don't you go ahead and sing another verse. Just Maybe you have the courage now. You're among all believers are in this room. We're so happy. Foster comes today to rededicate her life. She knows she's been saved, but she knows God wants her to pursue her faith. And so she comes today to do that. We rejoice with her, and they've reloaded her and her family's relocated to this area. I'm so glad for you, and we're happy and rejoice with you, Mandy. Let's give her a round of applause. Amen. Lord bless you. Amen. And we'll be talking with them about, uh, about uh, what, what they can do in, in becoming a member of this church. Let's go now. Uh, at this time, I believe we have a baptism. Are they already up there? Oh, here we are. Come on. Yeah, we're going to have a baptism. I love it. Two ordinances of the local church. We have uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is a great day. Amen for baptism. We'll take care of this young man. 